uh, happy Sabbath to everyone. Um, very pleased to be with you again. Today, um, our title is going to be Living with Purpose, and uh, hopefully you already do. Um, we're going to talk about the characteristics of a prepared Christian. Um, are we prepared for the kingdom? Are we prepared to meet Christ? Um, I'd like to start off with just a mini quiz, so uh, if you would. Think about this. The Christian life is so difficult that no one can live it. Lex is going off over here. Just pull the power. Pull the power plug. There you go. All right. The Christian life is so difficult no one can live it. Um, true or false? Feel free to type an answer, say an answer. So much better when we have a crowd for interaction. False. 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 Yeah, I would agree. False. Um, there have been thousands upon thousands of Christians who have endured to the end and have salvation. They did live it. Um, living the Christian life is often portrayed as being challenging in the Bible, uh, requiring dedication and perseverance and reliance on God's strength. And here's some verses uh, on the screen that highlight the difficulties faced by believers that may make people think sometimes, oh, this is too hard. These verses remind us the Christian's life can be challenging. And we're told there's a war going on between the flesh and God's spirit that's within you. And this causes conflict between you and your unsaved family, friends, and strangers. Um, some will face uh, some saints and have in the past and will continue face tribulation, persecution. Some will be put in prison, some tortured, some beaten, some killed just for living a Christian life. These are the difficulties, but it certainly doesn't mean uh, no one uh, can live it that it's that difficult. I think sometimes people will go, well, I can't do it because I always sin. And that's part also of um you know, relying on God. But we'll talk about that. Um, there's high standards set, um, you know, by biblical teaching. You know, we're told all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So th that human frailty can make us, you know, go, oh, I can't do it. It's too hard. Um, but you can do it. And he is with you. And if you lead with the spirit, um, you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. The Christian teachings often set um, very high moral st and ethical standards, um, such as, you know, loving your enemies, forgiving others, living selfishly and those uh, unselfishly. And those are the things that we're going to talk about a lot today um, uh, that are marks of a prepared Christian. Christianity also teaches the need for um, grace because it's not about achieving perfection through our efforts, but relying on his grace and his strength. Uh, for your notes, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Um, and while our life in this walk is challenging, the scripture also offers lots of encouragement and assurance to us. Um, you know, Philippians 4, 1, 3, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. We can make it through whatever um, tribulations or disasters if we continue with him and we abide in him. So while the Christian life is indeed challenging, it's not an impossible standard to meet. It requires humility. It relies fully on God's grace and a willingness to seek his guidance and his strength. And despite the difficulties, we find that living out our faith can bring us fulfillment, purpose, and, uh, our, and deepen our relationship with God. Another true false for you. The Christian life is so simple that even a child can live it. True or false? We got a true. 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 The statement um, that the Christian life is so simple that even a child can live it reflects the idea um, that the core principles 
of our faith, of Christianity, are straightforward and they're accessible to everyone, regardless of their age or their background. And there's some key aspects of this concept. I, I've got them penciled in on the screen down here. Um, Jesus himself emphasized the importance of having childlike faith. And um, you know, this indicates that the essence of having faith is simple. Um, we're trusting and humble, much like a child is to their parent. You know, when they're young, they don't question those things. They are obedient because they know their parent loves them and has the power of discipline as well um, at that age. Um, the core teachings of uh, Christianity, of love, forgiveness, kindness, and faithfulness, they're simple concepts that even young children can understand and practice. And that's our foundation. Our faith also emphasizes a personal relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. And it's not based on complex rituals or intellectual understanding, but it's on simple trust and reliance on God's love and his grace. And at the heart of Christianity is the gospel message, which is simple, yet deeply profound. Jesus died for our sins, was buried and rose again, offering salvation and eternal life to all who believe in him and will follow him. And while the core principles of Christianity are, are simple, living out the Christian life in a fallen world, as you know, can be challenging. However, the simplicity of living the Christian life lies in focusing on following Christ's example of love, humility, obedience, rather than complex rules and rituals. There may be some deep theological concepts and challenges, but in its essence, it's simple. Trusting in God's love and grace, following Jesus' example, and living a life characterized by love, forgiveness, and faithfulness. You know, everyone, every, every believer, can experience a full, abundant, purposeful, meaningful life. Um, for your notes, John 14, 12 through 14, he says, you know, if you believe on me, greater works will you do. And I'm going to my father. So whatever you ask in my name, I'm, I'll do. I got you. The Christian life is complex or difficult, but it can be a paradox of sorts. Um, it's so simple that sometimes we stumble over its simplicity. But Jesus said, come to me if you're you know, la laboring and, and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you're going to find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But that may take us to face martyrdom, but it's still a light burden, especially considering he's with us and he gives us all we need to succeed. It could be difficult for us because, you know, Living perfect um, isn't the goal. I mean, it's a goal, but it's not the goal. It doesn't get you anything like eternal life. It can get you a well done, good and faithful servant. But only through Christ is our salvation. The secret to walking our walk is to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and allow, allow Christ in us to live, you know, as Paul said, right, that, that it's not me, I die daily, but it's Christ lives in me. And those are the things that, um, you know, cause us to be perfected in Christ without, um, without difficulties. We read in the scriptures the end of both the righteous and the wicked. Uh, one of my favorite songs, Psalm 1, tells us, you know, that the believer, is his delight is in the law of the Lord, and, and he meditates in it day and night. So think about it. If you just even meditated on, you know, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself in a second. Right? Think about those things. If you are meditating on all those things, obviously that's, you know, what's within your heart, and it's coming out. Right, because it's from the issues of the heart, you know, that the mouth speaks and so forth. But it also tells us that the wicked 
uh, the ways of the ungodly perish, that they're not so. Right? They don't seek after God and his instructions. And therefore, you know, they have a they have a free life to live, right? They didn't earn that. They got that. But in the end, there's judgment. And um, the gift of eternal life is only extended to those who you know, accept the sacrifice of Christ and walk in faith and endure till the end. Another example for us is um, the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit. Um, Paul's exhortation is to walk in the Spirit, to allow the Holy Spirit to produce fruit in our lives. And, you know, that includes moderation and uh, self-control in our actions and behaviors. But, you know, take a few moments and review some of these works of the flesh, because these are the things that keep people out of the kingdom. And um, there are things in this list that you might be doing yet or done recently. Or look forward to doing. These are things that you need to consider as you move forward. I know the print's a little small, and I'm usually uh, used to here, but uh, just I'm going to just group some of these. But you can read these, um, and the slides will be available later. Um, you know, there's sexual sins, adultery, and fornication, and uncleanness, moral indecency. Those things are, are core. Um, there's spiritual wickedness, such as idolatry. And witchcraft, which is pharmakia, that's sorcery, and it also could have to do with uh, hedonistic drug use. Um, but occult practices, all that stuff's that lumped in there. Um, and then there's hatred and variance and emulations. You know, a lot of people will take uh, emulations and envy and, and they tie them totally together. And they, there is some difference. Uh, emulation is... Um, a desire to imitate someone's success or share their wealth, like almost like a keeping up with the Jones, Joneses, but maybe that falls more into the envy. But it refers to a strong desire to match or surpass someone else, which results in rivalry and competition. And it can involve um, positive aspirations if you are looking to mimic good qualities in someone, but it's negative usually when it's driven by selfish ambition or a desire for recognition over that person you're emulating. That's where, uh, when you remember emulation, just remember emulate, to emulate after. And that's what they think of. And then envying is a feeling of discontentment or resentment um, aroused by someone else's possessions or, or their qualities. Um, their opportunities, and a sense of ill will or jealousy towards them, desiring what they have or feeling bitterness because they have it and you don't. Um, and then other things uh, are divisive things here. We have strife and seditions and heresies. Um, uh, heresies is uh, uh, involving sects, sectarianism. A sectarian is a person who strongly supports a religious or political group that they're a member of, but may cause problems from other groups that it's you know a part of a sect of. Um, so that and uh, then there's um, murders uh, and envying. So those kind of also can go together. And then drunkenness and revelings, or, or that's you know that's partying. That's um, um, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, cutting loose, if you will. And these are the things that the world chases after. And these are the things that can bring um, us down. Um, but there's light at the end of the tunnel if you get to your knees and can turn and repent. Because it's easy to avoid these things if you are led by the Spirit, if you walk in the Spirit. Because the fruit is in opposition to those works of the flesh. And if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, um, as we read in Galatians. But um, examples of these are, um, I'll just hit examples. Uh, the example of love, a sacrificial love like Jesus' uh, love for you on the cross uh, and love for his Father in obedience. Um, joy, is the joy of the Lord is our strength, for an example, uh, Nehemiah 8.10. Uh, peace, the peace of God surpasses all understanding. We read in Philippians 4.7. Um and that comes from having a right relationship with God. There's long suffering, which is patience, uh, patient endurance, I guess I could say. Um, 
God's long suffering with humanity, as Second Peter three nine tells us. You know, he's not slack; he's not willing that any should perish. So he's he's holding on, hoping that some will accept that and repent. Um, gentleness, you know, uh, example Jesus's gentleness um, with towards sinners. Right? I mean, he didn't hard handle them like he did the, the religious right sinners, those who, you know, were white at sepulchers. He handled them differently. Um, but even in that, there's a gentleness. Uh, goodness, an uh, example is God's goodness and mercy. And then um, faith, of course, Abraham's faith is a great example for us. Uh, God's promise of a son to him and what he went through, followed through in obedience for um, and then uh, meekness, Moses is described as the uh, uh, meekest man on earth. Um, power under control is how you can remember meekness. Uh, and then there's self-control uh, or temperance. Uh, and I always think of Joseph's self-control in resisting Potiphar's wife. You know, Potiphar didn't keep, leave, keep nothing from him uh, except that. And, that's, and, and he was faithful to God in all that. You know, um, Christ said that, if we continue in his word, then we're his disciples indeed, and the truth will make us free. He'll make it known to us, and it'll make us free. So think about what you would consider to be the characteristics of a Christian who's ready for the return of Christ. What constitutes a prepared Christian? One, one example is Colossians 3.12 here. tells us to put on, therefore, as the elect of God, Holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering. That's a tall order. So, and these things, look at yourself and measure yourself. Don't compare yourself to others. Uh, we're told not to do that. The Passover season has passed us, but that introspection should happen all the time. If God was drafting people onto his team based on qualities in his passage, where would you be picked? First, last, middle, would you be drafted at all? Now, good thing God isn't doing it that way. But are we prepared Christians? We're told in Ephesians to be strong, you know, and put on that, that whole armor of God. Be strong. That doesn't mean in yourself. Where does that strength come from? You know, it's the Lord. We're to stand in his might, in his strength that tells you, in the power of his might. And put on the armor. Why? Well, because there's a fight against dark spiritual forces in heavenly places. This fight is against an army of the wicked. Not flesh and blood wicked, although they do have pawns who work in that regard. But spiritual influence. The battle is one you can't win just by yourself. The Bible teaches that Satan and his followers are enemies of God and all humanity. They entice mankind to sin. Therefore, sin is also our enemy. And it's our great enemy. We're told uh, to submit ourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And we're told to be sober and vigilant because Satan is it's like a roaring lion just walking around devouring whoever he will at will. You know, And we're supposed to resist him standing in faith, knowing that, hey, you're not alone here. These things are happening with your brethren. But after you've been through this and suffered, God's going to take care of you. He's going to make you perfect. He'll establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. It's easier to resist by following, you know, some outward precept or, or command, right? That's, I mean, those are easier things to do. Hey, don't, don't eat this. Uh, go do that. Keep this day. Those are the easy things to do. But the real battle comes when we must love and care for others over ourselves, isn't it? And that's why everyone will debate all the other things, causing, causing um, uh, violations against the fruit of the Spirit, if you will, while they're 
trying to you know, prove their point in their works of the flesh being so good. We have to be careful with that. That's huge. Yes, yeah, sin is our enemy. Therefore, it's necessary to fight against it. And the only way to stop evil and fight against it is with God. Right? The word of God is your weapon. That's your sword. Take it out. And God is more than just words on a piece of paper. He is the living God. He has the power. Scriptures are, are great to have. A lot of believers before us did not have such a thing, and yet they had faith. Abraham is a great example. So remember those things, who they worshipped. A lot of people get stuck into that word. They can make an idol of the word just like people make an idol. You know, Catholics make an idol of a cross. These things can happen, and we have to be careful. Now, um, we're told, though, to you know, stand and fight. Be strong. Be strong and have great courage. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of uh, sins that are, are trying to get you. Those thoughts, those desires. Uh, you know, Joshua had just fought the battle of Ai in Joshua 10 here on your screen. And uh, they slaughtered, the Hebrews slaughtered them. The Israelites won uh, substantially. And, and Joshua was telling his people, just like he was told by God, look, don't be afraid. Be strong, be of good courage, because the Lord's going to do this against all the enemies against whom you fight. you got to fight. The battle isn't against flesh and blood. Again, unless you mean your own flesh struggles, which is where the battle is. We have to care about people as well as our theology. Paul prepared for the battle by strengthening the church's, the congregation's doctrines and their relationships. He was always trying to mend those relationships between them and God and each other. And we can learn biblical examples and principles such as love and service and humility through faith and prayer and understanding by reading our Bibles and asking the Lord to show us, to, to lead us in the way. To, if we surrender our lives to following his will, Right. A spiritually healthy Christian is one who will fulfill his or her role and lead to continued growth in their sanctification until Christ returns. So, I mean, I got to ask yourself, I ask myself, am I growing at all in relational skills? Do I relate to others better now than, say, a year ago, two years ago? How about... My, my Bible skills, am I using that sword besides, you know, to slice other people, right? I'm not supposed to do that. I, I, am I obeying God's word and resisting sinner, sinning better than I did, again, say a year ago? And you need to ask yourselves these questions too. So just take a stop where you're at. Remember, again, your hope and salvation is uh, you rely completely on the grace of God. So don't let that trip up. The devil's going to try and get you from both sides. So remember that. But the word of God is your sword. Learn it well and pray and know that your strength for the fight comes from God. And that's why you got to put on that whole armor. So let's read together some verses to see a more clear picture of a healthy and healing congregation or church or individuals of a church by reminding us what the Bible says, as we, being the body of Christ, should be doing. You know, believers are told to be devoted to one another and to give preference to one another, Romans 12, 10. I may read some of these on the screen, but they're on the screen, and like I said, the slides will be available later, but I may just refer to them um, rather than quoting constant scripture to you, which I don't mind. Um, uh, you know, I enjoy a lot of uh, scripture in a message because the, those are those are easy to repeat um, and I the, the, when I if I speak more on my own I have to make sure that it's the spirit leading me because you got to handle the word of God with care and you know fear the living God and uh, I, I hope that all who would speak his words would do such a thing but um, back to the slide is we're supposed to be devoted to one another and to give preference to one another, to esteem each other better than ourselves. That takes humility and lowliness of mind. And 
I mean, again, rate yourself in these things when you look at yourself. Don't just look at, you know, uh, days you keep or foods that you abstain from and so forth. Uh, you know, the, the kingdom of God is not food and drink. The kingdom of God is within you. So let's talk about judgment, right? Um, there's the don't judge and judge verses. Let's look at those. Um, there's a apparent conflict in this these verses on the screen with other verses regarding judgment, but they can be resolved by understanding the different contexts in which the term judge is used. So always pay attention to context, context, context. Um, they refrain from judging one another. A Christian who is perfect and is ready refrains from judging one another. Well, again, what's the context? Paul is addressing disputes among the believers regarding non-essential matters, such as food and special days, and he urges them not to judge one another in these matters, but to focus on not causing each other to stumble in their faith. If only we in the Church of God could learn that, because we're constantly harping on those things to other believers because they don't do those things. And we should be concentrating more on morality and the, the strength of the gospel itself. A prepared Christian doesn't speak evil of another or judge another. What about that? Do you see that happen in the church, in the congregation at large? Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother is judging his brother and is speaking evil of the law. And judging. And then there's one law giver. You're, you're setting yourself up as the judge. You're usurping his spot, his position as the judge in that. So you, these are the things we got to think of. You know, James is cautioning against these things because um, we're essentially setting ourselves above the law and acting like we're the ultimate judge in matters, which is not our role. But you got to take the other side of the coin. There is a righteous judgment that we have to have. Judge uh, and compare these next verses with those on the previous slide. Leviticus 19 tells says, uh, you know, this is the, even in the Old Testament, the Israelites were told to judge righteously without favoritism or partiality. And it emphasizes the importance of fair and just judgment in society. You know, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. You shall not respect the person of the poor or honor the person of the mighty. But in righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. Not, don't judge by appearance, right? God doesn't, and we shouldn't either. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The context of, of that in John is Jesus said this when they had accused him of evil for healing a man on the Sabbath day. Because the religious Jews were like, oh, that's work. You're working on the Sabbath day. And in appearance, Jesus you know, talked about circumcision. He says, in appearance, to circumcise a child on the Sabbath might seem, seem like it's a violation of the law. Yet, they're told that, that they do it. And he says, hey, yeah, and you do it. Because why? Because it's right and it's lawful. On the appearance, it may be a violation of the Sabbath to heal a man, yet it's right to do works of necessity and mercy. Jesus is teaching his disciples and us to do, judge with discernment and with righteousness, not based on outward appearances, but on the true nature of things, which you know, the Spirit will reveal to you if you're walking in the Spirit. Jesus is encouraging them to make judgments that are in line with God's real standards, fuller standards. And I think that's something that we all can learn from. A prepared Christian is also harmless and unprovoking. Um, they don't hurt one another. Right? Paul had to write to more than just the Galatians about you know, this type of thing, biting and devouring one another. Hey, you know, you're going to consume one another. This, is this what you're here? Don't be doing this. Don't be provoking one another and envying one another, looking for glory for yourself. And these are the things that carnal people do. And yet, you know, we accept it. And we have to not accept it in ourselves first and then in others, right? Um, conceit and jealousy can destroy a lot. And it's, it's a work of the flesh, brethren. Be careful that we start, don't start to justify why we are doing those things or feeling those things. Your feelings aren't bad, but 
they can lead to sin and they can be sinful if you um, rely into uh, lean into the negative ones and uh, and try and justify yourself a prepared Christian is um, also helpful and patient um, we're told to bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law that way and to forbear and forgive one another right to, with patience lowliness meekness these are the things we're supposed to be showing forth to one another and sometimes you see these things and it's wonderful when we see these you know examples of fruit uh, in you know God's church wherever you know it may be I'm not talking about an organization I know God's people and it's wonderful to see but it's Sometimes I think we turn a blind, blind eye when we're not seeing those things. And we should be because Jesus told us, by the fruit you shall know them. And so these are the things that Christ considers important. Um, saints comfort one another. Um, they pray for one another. And anybody who's, you know, got comfort from somebody knows how important that is. You know, like, the, like God has comforted you, you know, at one point at least. Then you can comfort others with that same comfort. And that's what, you know, the apostle said too, right? Um, you know, hey, just as we, you know, have comforted you, you can comfort others with the same that same comfort you have in Christ. Comfort one another. Um, encourage one another. Pray for one another. Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And a righteous man who is one who is abiding in the vine, abiding in Christ. A prepared Christian is stimulated to good works, right? They try and get others also, provoking them, or stimulating, I would rather use, to love and to good work. Because we're created for that purpose. We're created for good works. And God told us that, hey, he made us so we should walk in them. And at the very bottom, I, you know, I, I threw in, let your light shine before men so that they can see your good works and not glorify you, but glorify your Father, which is in heaven. And that's what's so important. Um, and I just use a, a light example. I mean, there's bigger examples for sure, but let's take a musician in, in, who comes to, into a church setting and they play you know, a song or whatever. Are they taking adulation, adoration for themselves, you know, for their ability and, and their deliverance of that? Or are they bringing an offering to the throne and to the saints in that type of manner with humility? Those are the types of examples that sometimes I think of in these things. A prepared Christian will exhort and encourage others. And we're told to do it daily. I mean, um, we talked about the difficulties of, of a Christian walk. And sometimes we need that encouragement all the time. Um, and that's good. Encouragement is good. It keeps us, you know, going. We kind of, um, I don't want to say feed off of each other. The, we are inspired by others in their zeal. And we can be as too. Yeah. And Hebrews 10 talks about not forsaking ourselves together. And that's important. I mean, to get together... You can't exhort one another if you're not together in some form or fashion. Sometimes it's long distance. Sometimes it's, you know, arm in arm. But these things are things that believers should be exhibiting all the time. To be kind and forgiving is another. Tenderhearted, right, and forgiving one another. I think about my own heart and how God has softened it. I, you know, the, it's almost like that story of the Grinch, right, with the heart, little heart and it grows big. Um, as God forgave you, I'll, I'll use me myself, as God forgave me, I have to think of all the things I said and done that warranted the death penalty from him, and he has forgiven me for them. What can I hold against somebody else? How can I hold something against them when he has forgiven me so much? Again, uh, Colossians tells us forbearing and forgiving. Oh, I can't stand when the so-and-so does that. Okay, that's forbearing, and now you're mumbling and grumbling, and uh, that's supposed not supposed to happen either, right? So you got to check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? It says if you have a quarrel against any person, 
As, even as Christ forgave you, so do also. Now, uh, some people would be like, well, I'm not forgiving them because they didn't repent. Well, <clears throat> forgive as you want to be forgiven is the way the Lord prayed it out for us. And um, I think that's important because, again, once you look at yourself and what you've been forgiven for, how can you offer any laughs? Free gift. It doesn't mean they're escaping whatever punishments for their actions. Um, and I would hope that you would, you know, instead of praying against somebody or having feelings against somebody, that you would rather, as a prepared Christian, be praying for them. You know, lay this not to their charge, as we've had biblical example of. Brings us also to submission. Um, we're told to be submitting ourselves one to another. I mean, I, I like the expression in Peter where it says to be clothed with humility, completely covered, right? There's no immodesty there. You're completely covered with humility um, because God does resist the proud. And you may be walking around that way without humility, with pride in a way, and God's not going to stop you. But think of the example that you're being. And again, if you're checking yourself, if you're walking properly, you, know, you we can, I don't want you to think that um, your good works save you. Right? Let's, let's set that back on the table again. That it's only through the sacrifice of Christ and, and the grace of God that we can have life. If there was a law that you would keep to get eternal life, God would have made it, but there isn't one. That's you know, we, we read that in scripture, as a matter of fact. We're supposed to be walking in truth, um, and that means not lying. So um, is there such a thing as a little white lie? I don't think so, right? I mean, rat poison, they say, is 99% good food and 1% or less poison, and yet it kills. Um, when does a truth become a lie? How much lie do you got to insert in there? Yea, didn't God say you can eat of any fruit of the tree? So we're to put away lying. And if, if you, there's a problem, if you're having a problem with that, you know, confess your sins to your father. If you, if you have a brother or sister you can talk to, talk to them and, and get it out. You know what? The darkness hates the light. You bring the light. That's why Christ said, hey, they hate me because I, I'm the light and you know, I manifest their evil. I, they see it. You can see it's on display for anyone. When you bring things to the light, and that's a, a saying, and the you has known me, I, I like to say, bring it to the light, bring it to the light. Because when you bring it to the light, it's like the cockroaches scatter when you turn on the light. You know, your darkness goes away when you turn on the light. Put a light on it, because otherwise you're hiding it. And that's with, uh, it goes with any sin that you may be harboring. A prepared Christian also will edify and seek to edify one another. If you have knowledge, you'll be able to share it, but not with haughtiness. And we got to be careful because true knowledge comes from God, not just from study. And um, But we're told to edify. An edifice is a building. You're supposed to be building each other up. Um, and if we spent as much time actually trying to build each other up as people do trying to tear each other down, what a difference the internet would be. What a difference our churches would be. How healthy is your congregation in these things? A prepared uh, believer also is able to teach. And they teach and admonish one another Psalms and hymns, spiritual songs. That's a, a great, easy way. I mean, if you think again of all the songs and lyrics that you have memorized, start doing that with your some of the, the good uh, hymns and that, that, that admonish and teach you about the ways and words of the Lord, not just about feelings like a lot of uh, newer uh, Christian music may do. Uh, a lot of that is about me, 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 instead of about him, him, him. So. Uh, think about um, as you're as you're um, teaching to not your teaching is to help the other person, not to lord over them. And I think that's really important part that a lot of us miss when we're attempting to teach. We tend to lord over, and, and Christ said, "Don't do that." Um, 
even under persecution down at the bottom, uh, they, they ceased not to teach and preach Christ. I mean, that's something that we should be always doing. And our, the, the main thrust of our speech, of our preaching and teaching should be Christ, Christ in everything. Just like on the road to Emmaus when Christ appeared after his resurrection with the two disciples walking on the road, and he expounded to them from the Old Testament all the verses how they all pointed to him and convert and and uh, explained it to them that it was about him because this is about him. A prepared believer, as I, I talked about a little bit earlier, about not holding a grudge, not ha having anything against one another. We don't hold grudges. It says unless you be condemned, because if you're holding a grudge, you know, hey, it's going to be measured back to you, you know, maybe twice over or more. Watch out, the judge is here. And then it says to use hospitality to one another without grudging. Uh, don't do it just be, to, to be nice. Oh, man, I want to hold the door, but you're going to hold the door. It's like um, a, a cheerful giver. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. If you're going to do something not in the kindness of your heart, you're going to do it for status or because it's expected. I mean, you have your reward. You know, you're, that you're not going to be fulfilling what God wants you to do. To be doing and this first message is hospitality which is on my next slide what a coincidence so hebrews tells us to be not forgetful to entertain strangers because you may be entertaining you know messengers from god unaware you don't know so treat everybody like they could be that and uh, romans talks about distributing to the necessity of the saints right when people are in need to give everything you have is belongs to god and you are a steward of it your, your, not only your money, but your talents, your resources, all those things, right? If it's in your, your ability to give, God says give willingly, just as it was given unto you. Um, and to be hospitable, to care about other people and give them care. So um, in that respect, we're also serving one another. And that's uh, the word minister is to serve. Now, lots of people use it as a, as a taller title, but it just means servant, just to serve. And a prepared believer will serve other people, other believers, you know, the household of God first, but then to serve others, to show forth, you know, the light of God through your works. Um, so many verses that say that. i got a couple on the screen for you. And ultimately, you know, we should be serving one another without grudging, without a the goodness that flows from the Spirit in our hearts. And um, again, measure yourself against these things and um, don't be looking around the room at others for the, any of these things. Uh, this is These are all part of your personal journey, but we also need to be our brother's keepers. So um, be careful in, in how you do that. You have to do that with all the humility and other things that we've been talking about. Um, the next several passages I'm going to throw up on the screen here are show that faith is a foundational aspect of you know, being a prepared Christian. It's through faith that we please God. It's through faith that we receive salvation. It's faith uh, that we experience the power of our prayer. And it's through faith that we live out our Christian walk. Faith isn't just a belief. By itself because the devils believe and they tremble it's a belief but it's also more it's a trust and a reliance on god so it leads to your obedience a trust and obey right to trust in his promises to believe and then walk in them it's a belief in action belief in action confirmed again by our obedience um righteousness uh, of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it's written, the just shall live by faith. And this verse shows that faith is not just a one-time act, but it's a way of life for us. And this tells us how God made us right in his sight. It reveals that righteousness comes through that faith, and that faith through faith, the righteous person has life, right? All right. The just shall live by faith. Through your faith, you have life. Not on your screen, but let me add uh, Hebrews 10, uh, 38 and 39 for your notes. Hebrews 10, 38, 39, where it says, The just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. 
for we're not of them who draw back unto perdition, but to, of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So there's endurance in your faith, right? Um, and of course, Hebrews 11 tells us without faith, it's impossible to please God, right? Because if you come to him, you have to believe that he is and he is God. And then he is ready and willing and able to reward those who diligently seek him. And it's essential to please God. Um, so I can't um, highlight enough that believing in him solidly and trusting in his promises is a, a core part of being a prepared Christian. Other faith verses um, have us continue in the faith. Colossians 2, 6 and 7 tells us, As we receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you've been taught, and abounding therein with thanksgiving. All right. um, and earlier in the same uh, letter, Paul's words encourage and warn us to remain grounded in our faith and our hope in Christ, right? To it, and I underlined if, right? If you continue in the faith ground and settled and be moved, not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you've heard when preached to everyone, right? Then there's always an if then. We have to continue in the faith. It's like I said, it's not a one, one and done. And we know this um, is important that as prepared Christians, we um, walk in it. By grace, we're saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, I'm going to contrast that with the verse below it, James 2, 14 through 17. What does a prophet, my brethren, though a man say he have faith and have not works? Can faith save him? Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. Well, yeah. How do you reconcile that? Well, um, it's straight up the grace of God through faith in him and the finished work of Christ that we have salvation. None of our works, because you know what? Our works actually condemn us because as many times as you've kept commandments, you've probably broken them as much or more. And, um, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is that grace. Now, now that you have saving grace, and we have that continue in the faith, we have to show forth good works. Again, previous slides, we were shown that we should be walking in them. We were created for good works. So do the good works. Otherwise, your faith will shrivel up. You know. Those are the, the two examples. For your notes, um, also, I um, have Romans 9, 30, and 31, um, which talks about the Gentiles, which didn't follow the righteousness of the law, attained to righteousness, and, and Paul called it the righteousness which is of faith. And then they, he contrasted that to Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, but they never attained the law of righteousness. And then uh, also uh, Hebrews 4.2, um, the gospel was preached as well as, as us, unto us as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, Israel, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now, obviously, there were many saints in the Old Testament that did have salvation looking forward to Messiah. They had faith, right? like Joshua and Caleb entering the promised land. They had faith in the Lord. But... Um, He's talking as a bulk, national Israel as a bulk. Didn't, they didn't hold forth faith. They, they held forth works, and they, that's what they promoted. And uh, it would rather condemn them than save them. Um, Hebrews 4.2 highlights such an important aspect of faith and the relationship to receiving the gospel message. You know, that... You have to receive that gospel and then walk in, walk in that faith. Um, I would like to think of a better example, but right now it escapes me. So um, after faith, we're going to come to hope.
Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Right? A lively hope. You know, and it's that through our faith that we have that hope. Um, Romans 15, 13 says, The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Why? That you may abound in hope through the power of of the Holy Spirit. Again, through the power of the Spirit is how all of this works, where our strength is in the Spirit. Romans 5, uh, we'll read this 2 through 5. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace where we stand through Jesus Christ and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. There's some of the difficulties. Knowing that tribulation is working patience and patience experience, experience hope. And hope is making us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. And this passage, I think, highlights the progression of Christian experience, starting with faith, leading to hope, and ultimately resulting in the overflowing love of God in our hearts. Hope is portrayed um, in throughout the scriptures as a source of strength and endurance through trials, leading us to a deeper experience and more intimate experience of God's love. In Hebrews 6.19, it told, tells us that hope um, we have is an anchor for the soul, sure and steadfast. Um, it provi an anchor provides stability and assurance amidst life storms. You're not going to blow away in the storm. And this verse emphasizes the reliability, the steadfastness of our hope. Of our, if we're anchored in the promise of God's faithfulness, it's his faithfulness. Um, hope isn't just wishful thinking for Christians. Um, a lot of people will use that, well, I hope so. Um, but it's a confident expectation based on the promises of God, wherein we have our hope. Right? It's a um, inspiring thing. It provides strength. It provides assurance and joy in the midst of trials. So it is solid. It's an anchor. It's not wishful thinking. It points us to the ultimate fulfillment of God's purposes in Jesus Christ. And as a prepared Christian, of course, <clears throat> we should be exemplifying in truth, love. Uh, we're told to love one another and to own no man anything else. And if we love one another, we're fulfilled the law. You're not transgressing the law by loving one another, loving God and loving one another. Um, it can be feigned, according to First Peter. Right? You can fake love of the brethren, and I'm sure you've all experienced some of that. Uh, be careful judging. Um, but... We're told to see that we, each of us, love one another with a pure heart and fervently do it, right? I mean, um, to love with all you have. And then uh, cut off Galatians a little bit. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 says the Lord will make you to increase it and abound towards love one another. If you're abiding in Christ Jesus, he is going to make you increase and abound in love towards one another. Not just one another. Oh, he, man, what about him? He's not my brother. Towards all mankind, even as we do towards you. 1 Thessalonians 4.9 points out that we're taught by God himself to love one another. He loved us while we were yet enemies. Shouldn't we do the same? Think about these things and measure yourself in accord. Our thoughts, our thoughts is where it really can get us the, that silent killer, if you will. It's not hypertension, right? It's sin within your members. Um, 1 John 3.11 tells us, again, this is the same message from the beginning love one another that's what you know you're going to fulfill the law love second john now i beseech thee lady not as though i wrote a new commandment unto thee but that which we had heard from the beginning that we love one another 
First uh, Peter 3 8 tells us to love as brethren, to have that camaraderie, that um, togetherness, to be of one mind, he says, have a great compassion for one another. Uh, not just extending a polite courtesy, but actually having that in your heart, that courteous heart in caring for one another. And first John points out too that this is the this is his commandment. He said, Keep my if you love me, keep my commandments. This is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave us commandments. So important. That's how we fulfill our walk. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that is loving is born of God and is knowing God. You can dwell on that one all day long. And if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Isn't that true? Again, while we were yet enemies, he loved us. And then John points out, if we love one another, that's a sign that God, who is love, is dwelling in you, and his love is perfected in us and through us. In the end, faith, hope, and love is where I've kind of culminated for us today. Um, these three remain for us to walk out in this Christian life, and the greatest of these is love. The secret of the Christian life is to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit with purpose, and thus allow the Lord Jesus Christ to live abundantly his life through you in all his glory. If I try to live the Christian life in my own fleshly effort, it does become complex and difficult and even impossible to live. And you can see many people struggling with that, pushing others to, to get where they are, but they still have their own struggles in all of it. But if I surrender myself to the Lord Jesus Christ and I allow him to direct my path in my life, if I know the reality of having been crucified with Christ and raised with him by faith, and if I walk in the light as he is in the light through the enabling of the Holy Spirit, then the Lord Jesus Christ simply lives his life, his holy life within me and through me. And this was at the heart of... Uh, the Apostle Paul's moment-by-moment moment experience when he said, I've been crucified with Christ, and I myself no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the real life which I now have within this body is a result of my trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For he knows that's Galatians 2.20. And in conclusion, living with purpose as a prepared Christian involves embodying the characteristics that we've explored today, faithfulness and readiness, humility, perseverance, and a focus on eternal priorities. And as we strive to live out these traits in our daily lives, we can trust that God will equip us with everything we need to fulfill his purposes for us because he's given us the Spirit. So let's all commit to being prepared Christians, always ready to shine the light of Christ in a world that desperately needs his light, his love, and his truth. Let's live walking in the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, empowered by God's grace, and let's all make a difference for his kingdom. Let's show the, you know, the unity that was written of. Father, make them one as we are one, that love. Let people see that instead of all the division that they see in the congregations, um, you know, at large. So I thank you for listening to, to me. I'm going to say uh, keep living with a purpose, and I'll turn it back over to Brother Kevin in Woodstock.